dear colleagues, uh, my name is Bart Fasser, and jointly with my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Nick Mecklen, uh, we are chairing this uh, day's uh, joint session, uh, RBMO Life and the International IPF Initiative, uh, I3. Uh, this is the third one of a series of this collaboration uh, and this webinar. It's uh, an exciting adventure. This is 90 minutes high speed science and interaction, uh, three brief lectures uh, and time for discussion during the first part of this uh, uh, webinar. And then after a debate between two very senior people also involved heavily in the journal as you will learn uh, later. So overall, the, the, the theme is uh, related to a new section of the journal RTS, uh, Reproductive Technology and Society. And uh, Nick is one of the editors who particularly focuses on this, uh, this section. Uh, this is new and challenging, something indeed uh, different, as you will also see in uh, the topics being addressed uh, uh, today. So we have selected uh, three recent publications and asked people to prepare a very short introduction to discussion, just a, a five minute presentation. Uh, and, and so in between there will be just one or two quick questions, but after the three lectures jointly, there will be ample time for further discussion based on your questions. Uh, so again, I would like to ask uh, you to raise your questions and have them in the Q&A session and not the chat session. Uh, that's the way we can deal with them uh, and have a, have a, a profound discussion afterwards. Uh, so again, I mentioned this is the third of uh, a, a joint webinar between uh, I3 and RBMO. Uh, and in, indeed, it is quite, a, a, quite special for this. Um, um, okay, yeah. Further information about the journal will follow uh, later. So let's get going with uh, my co-chair for this evening, Professor Nick Becker. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about the context of the RTS, this is, um, as many of you know, quite a new section to the journal. It focuses perhaps uniquely, I would say, in, 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 the, in the journals in our field on the societal aspects, the implications of the developments that we see, an assessment of the developments in ART looking to the future, but also established treatments. And I think it's provided a very um, exciting new platform for high quality academic discussion in this field. So it's a great pleasure to, to, to introduce the, the, the three speakers this evening who will be tackling, I think, topics we'll all find resonate with us in our practice. And the, the, the first uh, topic is going to be um, on the issue of, you know, what motivates people who've had donor sperm to find out something or even contact uh, the sperm donor. Um, and this paper was, was published in, in RBMO recently. The first author who will be presenting to us tonight is uh, Caitlin McMillan. And Caitlin's doing a PhD at Deakin University. And uh, uh, we're delighted to have you here, Caitlin, and I'm very happy to give the word to you. So please go ahead. Thank you very much for that introduction and the invitation to present our study. I'm here representing the uh, Sorry, I hope you can see me now. I'm here representing the um, authorship team, which also includes uh, Sonia Allen, Melissa Johnson, and Mark Stokes. The preliminary aims of our study were first to establish if it would be possible to directly access a sample of donor conceived Australian adults, which we knew would be difficult due to the anonymous nature of donor conception at the time when their parents access treatment and the non disclosure advice that was likely given to them. If recruitment was successful, we sought to find out a bit about them and their disclosure experiences, and then to find out if they were motivated to seek information about their donors and potentially contact with their donors. At the time of this study, access um, differed by states and only a few Australian states had a point of contact or a system for which donor uh, for non-identifying information could be sought. The Victorian legislation that retrospect re retrospectively abolished anonymity had not yet come into effect. So if I could have the first slide, please. 69 donor conceived Australian adults aware of their conception status participated in our online survey that was open for three months. They varied widely in age from 20 to 53. Their family structure was mainly heterosexual couple parents at the time of their conception. 
but only 42% were raised in a family home with two, with two of the intended parents. Majority were told of their conception history by a parent and had known for between one and 45 years. Half associated an event with disclosure, some of which were adverse. The most commonly associated event was a parent divorce. 83% self-reported having experienced a mental health issue at some point, most commonly anxiety or depression. Next slide, please. Um, oh, that slide that's there now. Um, participants were, sorry, slide before if that's okay. Uh, participants were first asked whether they'd been motivated to seek information about their sperm donors, for which 88% had. They were then asked to list up to five motivations using free text. The most common motivations were for medical information, to expand identity, curiosity, to find genetic half-siblings and believing it was a right. Participants were then asked if they had been motivated to seek donor contact, for which 71% had. And the most common motivations were similar, wanting medical information, expand identity, curiosity, wanting to form a relationship and to find half-siblings. Next slide, please. A range of demographic characteristics, mental health and disclosure experiences, including those mentioned, were inserted into a logistic regression for each of the three most common motivations, first for information seeking and then for contact seeking. First, we looked at information seeking. So as years since donor conception discovery increased, a participant was significantly less likely to endorse the motivation of wanting medical information. They're also less likely to report being motivated by curiosity. When anxiety was reported, a participant was more likely to report wanting medical information as their motivation. For donor contact seeking behaviours, when a participant was raised in a household with two recipient parents, they were more likely to report being motivated by wanting medical information. When anxiety was reported, and again when depression was reported, a participant was significantly more likely to report wanting medical information as their motivation. And as years since donor conception discovery increased, a participant was significantly less likely to report being motivated by wanting medical information. The impact of anxiety was not as anticipated. Anxiety has been attributed in the literature with behavioural avoidance, particularly in women who made up the majority of our sample. But in our study, it was associated with an increased behaviour. It may be that seeking information and seeking contact for medical information was an attempt to relieve anxiety, or it may be that not having a complete and accurate medical history was related to their experience of anxiety. Likewise, the impact of having a two-parent household was hypothesized to be associated with a decrease in donor contact seeking behaviors. However, it was associated with an increase and uh, endorsement for medical reasons, so or medical information. It may be that the presence of a non-biological parent raises the awareness of potentially differing parent-child medi um, medical histories. So some implications of our research include, um, we confirmed that recruiting a large sample of donor conceived adults independent of their parents is possible. And this method is important considering that not all donor conceived participants in our sample learnt their conception, conception history from a parent. The findings of this study offer clinicians and policymakers insight into this somewhat invisible population and the implications of unfulfilled goals on participants' well-being, although it remains unclear as participants may not have been uh, successful in sourcing any or all information um, or if they wanted or successfully made contact. Donor conceived participants in qualitative research have described unsuccessful attempts as distressing and further research is needed to understand the mental health experience of donor conceived adults as the prevalence for, um, of mental health issues, although self-reported was higher than expected compared to a normative population. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. Uh, uh, I do realize that it's very early in the morning uh, for you, but still uh, uh, allow me to, to raise one question uh, before we move to the next uh, presenter. Um, th this is very useful information, great, a poorly studied area. We all have our ideas, but we don't really know because there's little data uh, so far. This really adds to the literature. My, my question is actually, uh, to how representative is this sample size in your idea for, for the, the Australian donor children in general in Australia, but also can you transfer this kind of information uh, towards other countries or do you think that there are major cultural differences? 
Good Please. question. Uh, regarding the sample size, I think it's really hard to know when a sample is going to be representative, especially in donor conception literature. There's so many things that need to be factored in, like how people discover their donor conception status and the age, uh, particularly when it comes to things like legislation and information access, which uh, for a long time differed in particularly, say, in Victoria, differed depending on when you were conceived. Um, and my sample is only uh, relating to people aware of their donor conception status, obviously. And um, how participants learned about the study, uh, we didn't track that, it's not quite clear. It is possible that maybe I've got a biased, maybe subgroup of donor conceived people who found out about the study through, say, groups where people were being supported for contact seeking or for information seeking. So that might relate to why the prevalence was so high. In terms of generalizing to uh, an international group of donor conceived people, I purposefully made it Australian donor conceived people to control for the different cultural effects and also the legislative effects. I think it's really important to try to branch out to other countries, but I am cautious of that because um, even things like the donor types available internationally are quite different in Victoria, in Australia, while my participants were most likely conceived from anonymous donors. It has been abolished in uh, across Australian states, but is available quite readily overseas still. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. Please, please uh, hang on because there may be questions, uh, additional questions later from the audience. Again, for the audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A uh, section and not uh, the chat section for your questions. Uh, then let's move to the second uh, 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 presentation. Uh, I, I have to admit, uh, 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 Talia, that usually I'm not a great fan of uh, catchy, jokey titles, but, but yours once was really great. And so, so it said it all. Uh, so so uh, uh, lucky, I don't believe in statistics. And we can all immediately understand what you mean by that. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, we would love to hear your, your story and just uh, tell a little bit who you are. Uh, you are by training a PhD in psychology. Your focus is uh, uh, medical decision-making. You are a professor at the Honor Academic College and a researcher at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Talia, please, the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you so much, Bart, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So it's a tragic comic sentence that we chose and it, we didn't make it up. It's a quote from one of our participants. Luckily, I don't believe in statistics. What we did is we surveyed women undergoing IVF treatments and it's a survey of women's understanding of chances of success with futile fertility treatments. Now, futile is a very harsh word. We are dealing with a harsh reality. We're dealing with women age 43 to 45 who are undergoing IVF treatments. And the OBGYNs in the room will know, in the virtual room, will know that these women's chances of success are not very high to say the least, hence the term futile. Um, this is work for, if you, we could have the next slide, please. That's great, thank you. Uh, this is work for which I received a grant from the Israel Institute of Health Policy Research with my co-author, Avi Tzafrir, the title of the grant was Reducing Futile Action. In English, it was called Choosing Wisely. So there's a, there's a vast difference between how things are phrased, but the essence of them is the same. We're not dealing with a medical question. We're dealing with a psychological question with decision of how are women making this decision? Granted, we did not ask the men in the picture if there were men in the picture, but we did start with the women. A bit about me, I am indeed a psychologist. I did my doctorate at Hebrew U. I did my postdoctorate at Princeton University with Daniel Kahneman. I taught at Wharton. I am now in Israel and I'm the author of Your Life Depends On It, What You Can Do to Make Better Choices About Your Health, where I tell this story of this fertility and of the woman who wrote, luckily I don't believe in statistics, I gave her a fake name and wrote about her. Because I think for gynecologists, for anyone dealing with fertility, psychology is there all along. You cannot avoid it. Uh, you're very welcome to contact me and tell me your thoughts about this work and about this perspective into your work in general. Next slide, please. 
So we're asking what is the women's decision process? But first let's talk about who are these women? So we had 93 women that we approached in IVF clinics as they were waiting their turn. So there was no specific recruitment process. And I think perhaps less of a selection bias than had we approached the general population. Like I said, their age was between 43 and 45. About half of them had a partner. About half of them had a child. When we asked how many fertility cycles have you already had, the answer was between one and 17. The average was five cycles, where in many countries, treatment cycles are restricted to four, up to four. In Israel, which is a very much fertility-driven country, the government funds fertility treatments for women until they are either age 45 or have two children. So in a state of a natural laboratory where women can have as many fertility treatments as they want, how many do they choose to have? We very soon discovered that this is the wrong question because they're not actively choosing or deciding how many cycles to have. We asked them, is there a limit to the number of treatment cycles you will have if there is no success? And 31% of them said, no. Okay, we're not judging anyone on their decisions and maybe these women will continue until they either have a baby or are told to stop. But even more alarmingly for them, not for us, for them, because they want a baby like the cute little baby in the right-hand corner of the screen, they don't want treatments, that's not their goal. 47% of these women said, I don't know. What does this I don't know mean? Does it mean I don't wanna think about it? Does it mean I have no idea? I just walked into this IVF journey and I'm not leaving. Does it mean I had not discussed this with my doctor? We have no idea, but we do know that the enter process where there is no guaranteed success, where there are alternatives and they don't know when they will stop. Similarly, we asked, is there a limit to the amount of money you will spend if there is no success? Again, 26% say, no, there is no limit. I will spend as much money as needed. 54% say, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't set a limit. These treatments are publicly funded, but what is not publicly funded are, public, are private consultations, complementary medicines, sperm donations, and the expenses for this free treatment can reach up to three monthly salaries of these women. And they were not billionaires, the women we spoke to. So this is a substantial expense. Again, what is your decision process? I don't know. What are your limits? I don't know. What is your goal? Remember, your goal is a baby. You're not, your goal is not to have treatments. So we were wondering what, what is going on? What is driving these women's thought processes? Perhaps they are being misled by their physicians. We didn't think that was the case, but we were checking. And when we asked them, what did your doctor say? None of them said my doctor guaranteed success. Very few of them commented on high success rates that were given by doctors. So basically the numbers the doctor gave was, were for the most part realistic. But what were the women's subjective success assessments? Let's see if we could have the next slide, please. Wonderful. So I colored this in pink and you will see why in a minute. Um, above, I wrote the objective success rates and you can, debate with me whether it's 5% per treatment cycle or a bit more, a bit less, and likewise, whether 15% cumulative delivery rate is realistic for women these, this age. But we will not move very far from these numbers. So these are the objective numbers. And when we look at the numbers below, we see that when we ask, what do you think the chances are your next cycle will end in the delivery? On average, it's 48%. This is not a typo. Objectively, 5%, subjectively, 48, almost 10 times as much. When we ask about cumulative success, it's 60%. Again, subjectively, it is 60%. Objectively, it is 15% on a good day. We see an enormous discrepancy and we have got to ask ourselves, what is happening? What is going on here? We've established that these women's doctors are not misleading them. They are giving them numbers and yet these women built something in their heads 
that is very, very far and disconnected from the truth to their disadvantage. Um, the portion of women estimating their cumulative chances for delivery is higher than 80%, is 32%, and only 21% of the women estimated their cumulative chances for delivery as lower than 15%, which is actually quite realistic. We did an analysis, which I did not bring here, but we examined the women and half, about half of them reported that their doctors gave them chances. The other half chose not to answer the question. I don't know what that means. I think, again, it goes along the lines of, I don't wanna think about it. Don't talk to me about it. I don't believe in statistics. I don't need your numbers. I don't want unnecessary information, which is what one of them wrote alongside the luckily I don't believe in statistics. Okay, so when we ran an analysis and checked whether or not the doctor giving some information made a difference on the women's um, subjective risk assessments, the answer was no. So no matter what the doctor said and whether or not the doctor said and whether or not the doctor said anything did not have an effect on these women's subjective risk assessments. Next slide, please. This clearly is very frustrating and it is very frustrating for all, first and foremost, for women who enter this journey and I talked about the cost in monetary terms. There is also physical cost, emotional cost, and worst of all, the cost of not having a child when you really crave one and could have a child in other ways at donation being one of them, but not the only one. So into this harsh reality, enter our physicians, enter the physicians who have to report this reality, who have to deal with this reality, who have to deal with women and their disappointments. How then can we improve? when we know that women decide based on hopes and not based on data. There are two ways I suggest helping. One of them comes from psychology and that is present information in a frequentist manner, as in five out of 100 women like you will have a baby in this, in this treatment cycle. So that's, we're not talking about percents anymore. It's a subtle difference, but it is very powerful. And there are endless studies on this. Five out of 100 women like you will walk out of here with a baby. And you can visualize that, but you can also visualize the 95 women who will walk out with nothing, without a baby in their hands. Will it make a difference? This needs to be tested, but I know that in other works, mine and others, presenting information in such a way, in a frequentist way, helped with risk comprehension, which is objective, and made a difference in risk assessments, which are subjective. So I can't say this is right or this is wrong, but I can say you can influence that. That was psychology. And now to behavioral economics. Again, Israel forms quite a unique state where you have bottomless funding and endless IVF treatments. What do you do if you think that basically after the fourth cycle, women's chances of delivery plateau? nudge women to create a stopping or a pausing point at the beginning of the journey. Say, let's, let's set a number. Let's start talking about how are we going to decide when, to, when and how to perhaps choose a different course. Let's do this after three cycles, four cycles. What do you think? This is what I propose. How much money are you willing to put into this? Or maybe the monetary question is not great because there's no objective measure there, but definitely the number of cycles is something that can and perhaps should be considered ahead of time and we need to test this empirically. The last point I wanna make is, as I said, this is harsh. It is also very tricky in an age of social media where you do not want to be denounced as the mean doctor who gave me this pessimistic um, outlook and I'm going to switch to another nicer doctor. Mind you, the first doctor wasn't mean, he was just being realistic. Women need to have their emotions acknowledged. They need empathy. They need to know that their doctors care about them and feel for their difficulty and what they don't need and what I believe and hope doesn't happen is for them to be um, fostered into too much hope that is then unrealistic and prevents them from having what they really want, which is a child. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Talia. That's a very uh, thought-provoking presentation with some very interesting and practical thoughts uh, for how we might address this. With an eye on time, I think what we're going to do, if that's all right with you, is save the questions for you for the Q&A session. And again, I would remind people 
uh, to, to use the Q&A function because I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in your talk. So thank you very much. And we look forward to, to joining you for, for, for your talk, uh, for, for discussion later. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce now our, our third speaker who's uh, coming to us from, from Denmark. Um, as it says there, uh, Anne Sophie Bach is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of the Study of Culture, University of Southern Denmark, and she's doing a PhD. She has done a PhD in sociology uh, there. What she's going to present to us tonight is some very interesting work that's come out of a project called Ice Age: Entangled Lives, Times, and Ethics of Fertility Preservation, which I think is a, a very nice summary of where we are with this field, where the technology seems to be nailed but we're trying to understand what the implications are for women and how they experience this. So it gives me pleasure to invite you, Anna, to take the floor and to give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this article um, on Danish women's experiences with ovarian tissue freezing and transplantation. Um, I also want to uh, express my thanks to my co-authors, Kirsten trude Mackholm and Stine Grygg Christensen, and to all the women who generously told me their stories. And next slide, please. So to prov provide a brief background, fertility preservation is known to be of great importance to ontolog ontological patients, uh, oncological patients, sorry, uh, and others suffering from disease that compromises uh, their fertility uh, or having to undergo fertility effective treatment. In 2019, ovarian tissue cryopreservation was declared, declared no longer to be considered experimental. experimental. In Denmark, ovarian tissue cryopreservation has been offered clinically since 1999, and more than 1,300 Danish women and young um, girls have had their ovarian tissue frozen. More than 100 women have returned and undergone transplantation. Existing research has primarily investigated decision-making processes as well as most studies are on the cryopreservation of oocytes and embryos. This study is the first to explore the experiences of transplantation and to go into depth with how patients navigate risk, chances, and outcomes. It is a qualitative interview-based study, which I, due to time limitations, shall not go into detail with. I just want to note that it is based on in-depth interviews with 42 Danish women who have undergone ovarian tissue cryopreservation and of whom 32 had also had ovarian tissue transplanted. Transplanted. This is about one third of the population in Denmark at the time of the study. Next slide, please. So we grouped the findings in four themes. First, the decision-making process where it is evident from the material that due to the context of disease and emergency, considerations about fertility preservation takes place during a stressful time. Here, ovarian tissue cryopreservation uh, provides a hope in the dark as it carries a possibility of, futures, of having a future and of survival. In this sense, fertility preservation is a future orientation. Some patients also talked about how the discussion about ovarian tissue cryopreservation restored a sense of control since they get to make decisions about future reproduction in the context of chaos. And with regards to having tissue stored, the patients talked about how it provided a sense of security about still having reproductive possibilities. It granted a sense of being able to go back on what they talked about as a normal life course after treatment, which some of them said made it easier to cope with the treatment. However, some also reported not having a precise idea about exactly how tissue transplantation worked. That is, not only is the information about ovarian tissue transplantation given at a time of crisis, it also requires an understanding of rather complex reproductive biology. And notably, the procedures between the Danish centers are not standardized, and therefore the level of information varied significantly. Those who lacked information noted that it made the possibilities feel unavailable. The third theme uh, is the transplantation. The context of disease matters significantly in terms of how the patients uh, think about and experience transplantation. All of the interviewees greatly appreciated the opportunity to pursue having genetically related children, and their accounts demonstrate that most of them are willing to go quite far to try to have them. However, the interviews also revealed many considerations about the risk involved with transplantation and with post-cancer reproduction more generally. In this sense, this group of patients' difference 
for most patients attending fertility clinics. Considerations about risk were especially prevalent among the women who had estrogen-sensitive breast cancers, those who had tested positive for BRCA genes, and those who had, for instance, sarcomas in the lower parts of the body. Yet concerns around preserved cancer cells in the frozen tissue emerged across many of the interviews. Although providing opportunities and hope, you can say that the transplanted tissue also reconnects the patients with their disease in ways that frozen oocytes and embryos do not. The study also shows how entry estrogenic medicine, such as tamoxifen, presents a specific challenge to women who get breast cancer in their 30s. They will need to pause, or in some cases, even refuse anti-estrogenic treatment to pursue pregnancies before reaching the 45-year age, 45 age limit of the Danish Act on Resisted, Assisted Reproduction, a matter that caused a great deal of stress and requires specialist counseling. And finally, during the interviews, many of the participants reflected on the use of surplus tissue, though many were willing to donate their tissue to research uh, or to others if that was possible. Uh, they also wished to keep their stories for as long as possible to keep open their own options, especially in terms of preventing premature menopause, but some also fantasized about the yet to be discovered potentials of this new technology. And the last slide, please. So to sum up, the study shows how hope and fear entangles in ovarian tissue cryopreservation and transplantation. It creates possibilities that the patients are extremely grateful for and positive about, but it also involves concerns in risk management uh, that oocyte and embryo preservation uh, do not. As tissue cryopreservation takes place at a time of crisis and urgency, not only is educational information materials important, but post-treatment fertility counsel uh, counseling should also be given, as well as sensitive follow-ups that do not stress out the patient about storage time should take place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, for sharing this information with us. Uh, this is, uh, again, unexplored territories, and, and, and the clinic in Denmark is, I think, uh, uh, very well qualified uh, to do this kind of research, quite unique uh, information. Um, one quick question before we move to the, the Q&A session. Uh, um, when you phrase the questions, uh, I think you as well, uh, like us, uh, you, you're thinking about, you have your ideas what the answers will be. My question to you was, because most of the questions about hope and fear is quite intuitive, uh, were there surprising findings, uh, findings that you did not expect uh, based on these uh, uh, feedback? I think actually what I was mostly surprised about was what I what we in the paper address as um, the considerations about future storage and, and all the ideas about where the technology would go that if they just had like one single piece of ovarian tissue left, it might be able to provide them with you know, the unknown possibilities of the future that they actually believed quite a lot in, in all the, the, the things to come. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that if that is so surprising, but, but they were very vocal about that um, and, and also sort of planned uh, for their own treatment uh, according to that, at least some of them did. Um, most of them obviously ended up using uh, all of that tissue. Thank you so much, Anna. So Thank please you. hang on. And could I ask the other speakers uh, to join us on the virtual stage? Uh, and could I uh, um, challenge the, uh, the audience uh, to come with questions? We have some, but of course, there's always room for more. So please don't be shy. If you have any issues which you would like to discuss with the presenters, uh, have it in the Q&A session, uh, and we will make sure that they will be addressed. Um, it's always good, I think, to do it in chronological order because usually people ask most questions about the story that they heard uh, most recent. Uh, so let's start with uh, Caitlin. And, and I see there's one question uh, raised by Ofra Balaban. Uh, uh, so you've been talking about the offspring from sperm donation. Is anything known about the offspring from egg donation? 
Yeah, good question. We did seek uh, all donor conceived Australian types. So whether or not it was double donation, embryo donation, and egg donation as well. Unfortunately, we weren't able to recruit any donor conceived adults conceived in methods other than sperm donation. Um, so I can't comment on what uh, the experience of experiences of egg donation people might be, but it could be that maybe that's a study for a few years in a few years time um egg donation became available or more accessible in australia in the 1990s and it's only more recently that it's becoming um the success rates and the and the accessibility is much higher so the donor conceived australians from egg donation are still very young like still relatively children and it seems that in the sperm donation literature, at least, that children or even adolescents don't have, uh, when they're asked, they don't aren't particularly motivated to seek information or contact with sperm donors. And so it might be an age-related thing where maybe around the age of 24, 25, I'm just speculating from some of the things I've read, that some of these questions come to mind and maybe medical history or curiosity, that's when it peaks, I'm not sure. So. Good question, but maybe I'll come back to it in a decade or so. I'll see if I can answer it then. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, Nick, maybe you take. Um, no, I wonder if I could just come in um, with a with a question. What was striking to me about your presentation, Caitlin, was that it seemed that the primary motivation for people to find out about the donor was about medical risk, and we've tended to focus a lot on sort of the curiosity angle. And I, as far as I could see, that seemed to be a fairly minor driver. Is that is that is that a fair um, conclusion? Uh, I wouldn't say it was a minor driver. I think in terms of the percentage of people who put medical history and curiosity, they were still both very high. Um, it just happened to be that medical information um, was a bit more prevalent. And I'm not sure if maybe the anonymous nature of the survey might have helped with some of the responses we got. Um, but in terms of the medical information, at the time, Australia, a lot of Australia states were going through some legislative reforms and people were um, invited to submit their feedback and responses. And it seems that asking for medical information was met with a little less, um, there was less comments in the media, I think, when people said they wanted medical information, but when people were saying they wanted curiosity, there was a bit more resistance and maybe some negative feedback received about what the implications of reaching out to a donor might be because you're curious, as opposed to medical information, it seemed to be the more socially acceptable response. So I think that might have also played into people's um, level of responding. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe one last uh, question, which I, I can find from the audience before we move to the next uh, speaker. So this one is also for you, Caitlin. Uh, so how did you uh, recruit your, your participants uh, and, and not going through the usual channels such as uh, the clinics or parents? This is a question from Ross Hunter. Yes, it was difficult. Um, we appealed to over 400 organizations and individuals. So anyone affiliated with fertility, donor conception um, or places where donor conceived people might be because we didn't have any they're not an identifiable population really and that was very cumbersome there was a lot of time spent on that and I think it was something that I would have changed is asking people how they found out about the study for next time because it is possible that maybe like I mentioned earlier that we did find or tapped into a subset of the donor conceived population maybe majority of our participants came from one source such as an online group um, which we also uh, posted the study information on. And so it is possible that maybe they access the study from a source that was supporting people in matching with donors, or it was from a source that people who experience anxiety or depression had gone to in order to find support or to find a similar network. Thanks very much. Uh, let's then move on to the second uh, speaker, Talia. Um, maybe one question from my side before we move to the, the questions from the audience. You mentioned in your presentation uh, that indeed expectations are high and positive or over positive 
despite the proper counseling from clinicians in, in the sample size that you studied. We all know that uh, uh, information is not always provided so uh, accurately as in, in your sample size. Uh, so would you think that this is an added effect? Uh, so patients are positive by themselves, even without good reasons. But on top of that, uh, often in real life, uh, doctors may give uh, a higher impression uh, regarding their individual successes than is uh, reality. I think probably both things are at play. What I do know about the women is that their evaluations were unrealistically high. Um, also, when we asked them to compare their chances to other women's, most of them were thought that they were a little bit above average or way above average. And that is very well known in decision theory. I mean, everyone's a better driver than average and funnier than average and, and likewise. So that is very common. I also think, and like I said, I, I, I can't even blame doctors. Who am I to blame a fertility doctor who has a woman in front of him craving to have a child if he doesn't really say, listen, your chances of having a baby this way are 5% this time, and overall it's 15%, so maybe choose a different route. But we, do, we did see signs that doctors weren't providing such optimistic evaluations. Mm -hmm. They were not misleading. They perhaps weren't quite as in your face or direct about the chances, but they were definitely not sugarcoating it to the degree that would involve such optimistic evaluations. Okay, thank you. Nick, maybe you can take over. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. I, I, I suppose there are a number of questions come in on that sort of theme about to what extent um, these unrealistic expectations are being, even if it's uh, unconsciously driven by information professionals uh, that's come from uh, Rocky Nunes Colón in Madrid and Galan Bahadur wonders if it's marketing of clinics that's partly adding to the problem of information, but listening to what you're saying, this is a different phenomenon. And uh, the third question that's come in has been from Daphna Carmeli, that's wondering whether indeed it's not the doctor that's the main influence, but the social climate, the media presentations, the expectations placed on women, the pressure put on them perhaps to, to have babies is making them, is driving them down this route. And I just wonder if you, if you would recognize any of those or have any additional insights as to why it is that women are behaving like this. I think Daphna is spot on and it's probably all of the above. And in Israel, it's very common to ask, do you have children? Why don't you have children? How many children? Why just two, three is great, four is better. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful country. It's also very intrusive. It's very family oriented and very intrusive. And everyone will tell you, I'm an only child. And everyone told my mother, why do you have only one? Do you really want to go into her fertility issues? No, but that's, that seemed to be a legitimate question. So there's definitely pressure for sure. The bottomless funding also sends a hint as if it says, well, just keep on trying. I mean, why not? It might work. That's basically what the funding is telling you because nobody's putting a limit on that. And uh, there is some sense of optimism. And some of the women have beliefs and faiths like they would say, my grandmother was very fertile. So I will probably be too. Or it is really worthwhile for my baby to be born. And honestly, I, I feel for them. But this isn't, it doesn't seem to be driven by marketing. It does not resonate with other studies that I saw, for, the, for example, in the context of cancer clinics, where they say, we, we give you hope. And the hope, when you try and put a number on it, is actually quite small. That is not what we saw in this study. Okay, thank you. So then the other question, then, of course, to what extent your findings would, could be extrapolatable to other contexts, you know, younger women, different countries. And I think, you know, a lot of doctors actually will, will recognize this in the sense that many of us spend a lot of time trying to get through to women what their true prognosis is and are faced by yes, but I still think I've got a good chance. And as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of special. Um, as, a, as a psychologist, so there, uh, you've given us a few indications of how we might manage that. Um, what, what role do you think that the clinician has in this? Is, you've suggested on one hand, yes, we should be supportive, on the other hand, realistic. What should we be doing when we face this, not just in older women, but perhaps younger women with mm -hmm. more of air in reserve? What should we be saying to these women, do you think? I think I made a few suggestions and I'm yeah. sure all of you are doing a really great job. I mean, in terms of presenting the information in a frequentist manner, 
providing some sort of a nudge for when are we going to stop and look for another way so you can have a baby. That's the goal. The goal is not to save money to the government. Um, given that people make choices and decisions really based on what Daniel Kahneman calls system one, it's very quick, it's very emotional, it's not really data-based. It's like, I don't want to hear the data. I just want to see a beautiful story and a beautiful baby. Then it might be worthwhile to talk about babies born with egg donation or babies who are adopted. And I have a, a colleague, you have a colleague, a fertility doctor in Texas who has a wall with the footprints of all the babies and some are adopted and that's fine because the message is you want to have a baby, let's try and help you get there. Um, I think that's a very important message. And, and it's funny almost to say that in a scientific conference to say, use emotion, but if this is what the women are using, then we should probably help them. Uh, one last thing with the media, we see women having babies when they're 15, that's a miracle. Nobody says, not even in the fine print, not their own eggs. So I think it's the media's responsibility. It's not fun, but it's the truth to say, look, it's wonderful. She has a baby and the way she got there is not through biological parenting. And does it really matter because she, what she wanted is a baby? One last question. Um, Cheryl van der Poel's questioning to, again, the, perhaps ex, can we extrapolate this to other groups and is perhaps asking the question if you were to repeat the study in 37 year olds, do you think you would also get un, a, a level of high level on expectation as a psychologist? Do you think that this is just a general feature of women going through IVF? I think I would definitely see a huge gap between objective chances and subjective chances. I think some of it comes from lack of knowledge of women going to freeze their eggs when they are 37, 39. And the, the best age to do that would have been probably a little bit earlier when their eggs were in better shape. Of course, it's, it's great that they're doing this, but they don't really know because they're not basing their decisions off of data. They're not, they are not showing up and asking the clinician ahead of time, look, I'm 33, I don't have a partner. I would love to have children at some point. When would it be realistic for me? When would it be a good idea for me? to freeze eggs and, and to have some data because otherwise they look in the mirror and they say, I look great, I look young, I'm fit, I do yoga. Um, nobody thinks I'm 42, but my eggs know the truth and they need, to, they need to understand this reality. Again, it's not a fun thing to say, but it's a good thing to say if their goal is to have a baby and that is their goal. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I think we do need to move on. Bart, maybe you want to take yeah. things further with the next speaker. Right. So um, time for discussion with uh, Anne. Anna, the, the third presentation. Uh, I see several questions. Uh, 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 one is from uh, Gulan Bahadur. Um, it's about uh, uh, ovarian tissue cryobase as a future security. Um, it is, uh, the question is, uh, does this not mean a lack of uh, sufficient counseling? Isn't this over optimistic, uh, uh, which may be related to the clinician and financial uh, implications, etc.? So, what are your thoughts on this? It, of course, depends a lot on, on the specific case of the patients and also, as was just discussed, age, age impacts uh, ovarian tissue uh, as well. Um, and I think we need to distinguish between when the women uh, haven't undergone transplantation or while they're in the process of it, and then the, the surplus tissue that I spoke about, which they, of course, um, some of them, some of the women that I spoke to had surplus tissue and had the children that they planned for or wanted, uh, but most of them didn't know if they would end up having extra tissue. And it, of course, also depends on, on the uh, procedures of transplantation that also differs uh, as far as I, I know between countries how, in terms of how much tissue you transplant uh, per, per transplantation um, mm -hmm. and for some it works really well uh, and for others it doesn't so that of course also affects the way that they sort of uh, think about their tissue uh, it also evolves obviously throughout uh, the, the treatment um, so in, in terms of whether it speaks to insufficient um, counseling, I, I would say that that, that <laughs> depends again between the situation. For some of them, they might be uh, unrealistic um, 
if they if they don't know the procedure or don't understand the procedure mm -hmm. uh, but some of them might actually have have this idea that they have they have this tissue lying in the freezer uh, that could be used for either maybe a third child or <coughs> as um, as uh, menopause uh, prevention you could say um, and there is a question related to that from Ofra Balaban. So is there anything we can learn from your observations in related to uh, uh, fertility preservation for non-medical reasons? Um, as far as I know, that's not something that is discussed uh, in Denmark. Um, and, and that would, of course, also be up to people who are better at actually evaluating whether this method will provide people with better chances. Um, I would say, and that relates a little bit again to, to the uh, menopause prevention that a lot of the women I talked to actually, they were really happy about the fact that the ovarian tissue was also able to reverse the premature menopause they went into due to their chemo uh, therapy. And they felt that it was, I think they, many of them used it, used the word more natural um, and it prevented that they would have to take a pill every day which made them feel less sick. Um, so it of course has some of those benefits, um, but that's again also, of course, a more medical discussion and I'm a sociologist, so I can't sort of go into the more biological aspects of that. Um, but still in, in, in more, because the, the two is a question uh, from, from uh, Peter Hassan about uh, tissue ovarian tissue cryopreservation for menopause delay, as it is mentioned in uh, the, the question, uh, what are your, I understand we are getting away from what you actually studied, uh, but what are your thoughts uh, on this, uh, from also the perspective of what you have learned from, from these reviews? Um, I would say that from the interviews, it, I wouldn't call it menopause delay, it, I would call it a menopause prevention, because a lot of these women would be facing what would be considered premature menopause due to their disease or due to their treatment. So in that sense, they weren't dreaming about uh, delaying their menopause until they were 65. But of course, that's been a discussion also in terms, um, and perhaps especially in Denmark, whether uh, it can be used for this uh, matter um, as well, and whether that is more beneficial in, in okay. terms of using um, hormone replacement therapy. Um, Yes, I think that's what the question uh, yeah. was getting at. Uh, uh, um, there will be little ethical debate about, you know, whether you could uh, uh, prevent premature menopause. Uh, but this is uh, advocated by some, which can also be used to, to just delay menopause, normal menopause. Uh, um, any thoughts on that uh, from your perspective? It, of course, features into ideas also about what, like, whether menopause is a disease and, and you can go into a lot of discussion about what kind of understandings we also have of women's aging and all, all these things. Um, I would say that a lot of the women I interviewed spoke about this as also not being a light procedure. It, it actually had uh, it had a lot of side effects. Uh, it, was, it was not something you just do to undergo this type of procedure. Um, but again, they were speaking about it as something that they felt more natural. Um, and that, of course, speaks somewhat to that some women might prefer using what they see as a more natural and using their own hormones in that mm. sense. Um, but it, of course, it is, of course, a very ethical debate whether we should sort of postpone menopause in that sense. Uh, and also in, in terms of what does it mean in, for uh, old age pregnancies, which has been an old, it's a huge debate in Denmark in the first place uh, in terms of setting the limits for assisted reproduction and what, what does it mean to, if we actually sort of would pr provide women with an opportunity to um, be fertile for longer. It goes very much against the way that it has been debated in Denmark so far. Thank you. And Nick, any final thoughts before we complete uh, this uh, uh, session? Not really. I, I, I think um, all three uh, speakers have presented very challenging perspectives for us to consider, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions that will occur to people. Um, and I would like to uh, uh, thank them all for their uh, contributions yeah. uh, to this evening, as I'm sure Bart does. Indeed. Thank you all very much. Uh, indeed, challenging topics, uh, all, I think, very representative for this section in the journal. Uh, 
and then we move on to the second uh, part of this uh, this uh, uh, webinar which is a, a discussion a debate uh, but first between two very senior prominent uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, professor guido pennings uh, and professor jackie boyvin uh, both uh, being a section editor of the RTS uh, section. Uh, and this will, th they will debate, but this will be, be really an extended introduction for further discussion uh, with you, with the audience. Uh, so Nick, uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you, thank you. And um, the topic, as you've seen, has been around about social egg freezing and uh, women's emancipation derived from a paper, inspired by a paper that I'd encourage you to read that uh, Guido uh, published recently. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, uh, Guido Pennings is a full professor of ethics and bioethics at Ghent University, where he's also director of the Bioethics Institute. He's had a very uh, profound influence on the discussion and development of ethics in reproductive medicine through SRA and through other platforms. And the other speaker this evening is another well-known speaker called Professor Jackie Boivin. She is a Professor of Health Psychology and Practitioner Health Psychologist at the Cardiff University in Wales. Um, she's played a major role in psychosocial research and clinical developments in our field and is on the Executive Committee of the British Fertility Society and, as Bart has said, uh, is one of our section editors in RTNS. So what we've asked them to do is to both make um, initial statements um, using a few slides. Uh, the, I will invite uh, Hiro to, to start by, I suppose, summarizing some of the points that he made as an article, which has led to considerable discussion, and I think um, provokes uh, um, the need for us to really ask some fundamental questions about the assumptions we have about what we think are the benefits of social egg freezing. So um, let me hand over now first to Rido for a few minutes and then Jackie will come in with uh, some responses and then we'll take the discussion uh, from there. Rido. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank both, both Bart and Nick for the invitation and for the opportunity to present my views on this uh, topic. Um, as was mentioned, uh, this is obviously, and we've heard it also in the previous talks, a topic that has already caused quite a bit of debate, um, uh, both in the professional world and in uh, society in general. And so what I have done, uh, in fact, comes down to um, a different perspective. So, so let me first of all clarify things um, and explain to you why I wrote this paper. Uh, the thing is that when you look at the research that has been done among women who have frozen their eggs, you can find that, in fact, in all the studies, the main reason for freezing is lack of a partner. Now, this seems to be something that would be worth paying attention to, while at the same time, as soon as you move away to the much broader discussion, that reason is largely ignored, which to me, at least, sounds like very strange. So if you have this common point, I would think it's worth looking at. So what you see in the literature is two lines of argument. The first one, and that is the most common one, is that the cause of the problem that will finally lead to elective egg freezing is the organization of the labor market, which very simply means that within our capitalist society, we spend very much of our time uh, working and that, in fact, all the time and energy we put into work leads to an incompatibility with family. Now, obviously, for women, this is more important than for men, given the reproductive uh, period. So that means that, in fact, they have to work both on their careers and at the same time, they need to establish a family. Now, since it is quite difficult to combine both, this leads to elective egg freezing. As I said, this is the most common line. Now, what I've done is I've started from this one finding, lack of a partner, and I've started to look at why is this the case? So then I do get a different kind of cause that starts it all. And in fact, the different cause that I uh, established was reverse educational gender gap. I will come back to that later. So in fact, that means that there are now more highly educated women then there are highly educated men. So this leads to a lack of highly educated men. And this lack of highly educated men leads to women having elective egg freezing. 
Now, this revert educational gender gap is in fact a worldwide phenomenon. So the thing is growing every year and almost in all countries across the world. Now, I just gave you one example here, and that's Europe. If you look at the data from 2018, tertiary educated women exceeded tertiary educated men by 11%. Now, I can tell you that makes up about four to five million women, highly educated women, more than there are highly educated men. Now, this in itself doesn't need to have to be a problem. The problem comes when there is a combination of this evolution with existing rules in the partner market or the marriage market. And one of the most important rules here is obviously that women generally marry up. So the male partner in general has a higher education, higher status, professional or occupational status, and a higher income. And then when you look at what is happening is that it is clear, at least to me, that elective egg freezing does not solve the lack of highly educated men. Now, what you get here is in fact two sides. There's a way to look at women, highly educated women as a group, and there's a way to look at highly educated women as individuals. Now, if we start with the first one, then I believe that elective egg freezing is a self-defeating policy. So applying this procedure in order to solve your problem of lack of men is not going to solve anything. And why? It's in fact very simple. The more women who freeze their eggs, the larger the pool of searches becomes. And the larger the pool, the lower the chance for each individual woman, woman to find a partner. So that means the more freezing, the bigger the pool, the lower the chances, at least assuming that the number of men uh, is not increasing. The second approach would be to look at elective egg freezing as an individual solution for some highly educated women. Now, this, we know that it is true, a number of women who are uh, freezing their eggs do indeed find the partner they want and they do this simply by buying time so they stay within the pool longer than they would have without the egg freezing moreover and we also know that this is an important reason is that women can avoid panic partnering meaning that they would just because they want to establish a family that it would uh, um, join a partner that is not up to their expectations. So in both cases, time allows them to make a better choice or at least to increase their chances of finding the right partner. But nevertheless, my conclusion, taking all this into account, is in fact relatively simple. I think that society should allow EF. There's no reason why it should be forbidden. It offers a solution for some, but it should not support or encourage it. And secondly, many highly educated women will have to become single mothers or look for another life goal. The way it is moving now, there's no way that all of them will be able to find the partner they wish for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guido. Um, a very uh, clear opening position statement, um, particularly interesting conclusions given the recent change in the UK and the duration for which we can store eggs now up to 55 years. And I think that sets the scene nicely to invite uh, Jackie Boivin to, to come in uh, and make her, her statement. Jackie. Have a sorry, I was on mute there. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me, Nick and uh, Bart, to have a discussion here about uh, Guido's very interesting paper about egg freezing and women's uh, emancipation. Uh, now, I have a slightly different version of his uh, argument here because I tend to be a bit more of a visual person. So if I understood his argument, basically what he's 
uh, arguing is that we have norms in society and we have childbearing norms. And these norms are that uh, in a pronatalist society, of course, is that people should have children and that they should uh, have a partner uh, with which to have these children and that they should have their children when they're young. And the partnering norm is additionally that it should be a suitable partner. So his argument about marrying up, especially for women or societies that, uh, where there's very strong gender roles. So women should marry uh, men that have more resources or that uh, are more educated and so on, because presumably that ensures better the well-being of the family. So I think he, Guido has like basically two objections really to, uh, or finds that these norms are problematic in two ways, which I'd like to counter argue uh, based on his paper, is one is that if you use uh, elective uh, egg freezing in a way, you're not making an autonomous decision because your decision is partly determined by these norms, right? So you want to comply with the norm of having children or you want to comply with the norm of marrying up. So I want to counter argue that in a way. His other argument is that because women are now increasingly more educated than men, that causes, uh, and because therefore there are fewer more educated men than women, you end up with some kind of shortage and that causes women to postpone their childbearing so they have more time to find the right man. Uh, and they manage this shortage as well as postponing by freezing their eggs. But the argument is that because egg freezing doesn't actually solve the shortage of men, you end up with a whole bunch of women that are uh, educated and have frozen eggs, but no nowhere to use those frozen eggs, uh, eggs if they want to live up to this uh, norm here. So I would like to kind of think of uh, elective egg freezing in a slightly different way. So in the ways that I agree with him is that there are these causes uh, to using uh, egg freezing, one of which is this sense of uh, a threat to future fertility, uh, whether that's infertility or not family size or et cetera. And this concept of incompatibility between career and motherhood. So I agree that these causes can induce people to use uh, egg freezing. But I think that actually women use egg freezing also for the consequences of using the egg freezing, because what they're really doing is trying to increase their own options. Um, now, I'd like to first say that I don't agree with Guido about his version of what autonomy is uh, in terms of you know, women complying with these norms. Uh, the first is that, uh, his version of autonomy is a little bit like women are just wanting to comply with the norm of having children or marrying up. Um, and they're not autonomous because those are social norms. So it's the social norms that lead them to using egg freezing in the sense of wanting to comply and they can't comply in any other way, but then to eat, to use egg freezing. In reality, I think that's like too strict a version of autonomy because Obviously, we're all in social worlds, so we're always influenced by social norms. I think the more important thing is for us to determine whether in choosing egg freezing, uh, women are doing so based on their own identified preferences and that they've identified their preferences, whether it is to have children or when to have children, etc., and that they have the means to act accordingly. And I think that they do. I think that the use of egg freezing for them creates additional time and peace of mind for their preferred reproductive choices to be made, basically. Uh, some of them will be, and most of them will be that they'll never use the eggs. Some of them that they'll use the eggs and have su success. Some of them is that they'll have a cost-effective option later in life. Some of them is that they'll have the time to process um, and come to terms with using other options but they're still preferred option. There will still be uh, autonomous choices. The other thing is I think that women are being autonomous in deciding about egg freezing in itself because egg freezing is not normative. So only about one, well, in the UK anyways, 
only 1.2% of people freeze their eggs. So that to begin with is not normative. And also women are creating new norms. So there may be norms of, you know, marrying up, et cetera, at the moment, but by the use of uh, egg freezing in this way uh, to, to say broaden the reproductive landscape for women, they are creating potentially new, new social situations that will have new norms. And then finally, I think that the whole marrying up and therefore not enough men, I think that that's not a reflection of what we know is the, is the situation currently. So if you look at the prevalence of hypergamy, which is this business of marrying up, so these are women born in 1954, and these are women born in 1980 in all these various countries. And all you can see is reductions in marrying up norms. So that means that as women become more educated, they don't need these resources anymore, uh, you know, need to find men with resources. And so they're marrying for other reasons and they are marrying according to the literature for relationship quality and relationship stability. And women have produced these changes in norms by opting to marry in a more homogenous way. I don't know what the, it's marrying neutral, let's call it. And so I think that that also is evidence of autonomous decisions and the ability of women to create new norms about reproduction. So that is, would be my conclusions. And so in the paper, the impression is that women are kind of just complying with these normative pressures uh, and waiting around uh, for, for the, you know, uh, upwardly mobile man, but I think that that's just not the case. And I, I, I think the waiting women is unlikely because they've already changed the marrying up um, narrative. And that's it. Thank you, Jackie. Um, thank you for, 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 for tackling uh, the points which um, I suppose relate or could come back down to this sort of what is driving women to do it, whether it's wanting to wait to marry up. We've had a couple of questions coming in that I'd like to, to, to put to you. One's from Gallum Bahodua. It's, he's, he says, it's odd that marrying up for women is so old fashioned while appearing to be coming up against uh, a brick wall. And commenting on the impact of social media now, and I suppose that would be the question to you. Do you think social media is subliminally driving, you know, the blind dating programs and Love Island and things like that? Is that adding to autonomy um, or is it uh, removing it? And do you think, do you think that, 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 that these messages are being spewed out to career women in the hope of getting them, the women to become more, more realistic? In other words, is social media, I suppose, a help or a hindrance in adding to, to a female autonomy in this regard? Maybe, well, uh, you know, Jackie, it, do you want to start and then uh, yeah. feed up? Yeah, I mean, I think the media is one of the vehicles by which social norms are communicated. And so there, there may be in groups of people norms to be attracted to people who wear particular kinds of clothes or uh, belong to particular uh, geographic areas or drive particular kinds of cars. That's, that's just you know, communication of norms. So the question is more about how people are behaving themselves and whether the way that they behave is according to their own, uh, you know, critically reflected upon natures and preferences. Now, I'm sure uh, Guido's going to probably counter argue that by saying, but, you know, the origins of everything that you think is always in, you know, your environment, i.e. you can't be divorced from your environment, but then that just makes a, that kind of autonomy argument a bit implausible, I think, but let's see what he says. Yes, Guido, please. <laughs> Well, I, to, to be honest, I can't really answer the question because I've never seen these television programs, and I'm, I'm not on any of the social media. So, what uh -oh. the what the <laughs> what the impact would be would would be quite difficult. But I have had discussions uh, about, uh, for instance, these uh, connection sites, these dating sites, like, for instance, uh, what is it, Tinder. Um, and uh, one of the issues that I mentioned there is the fact that, in fact, it might in, well, in a way, increase the idea that there's someone out there 
who really fits my idea. So I just have to swipe enough and then I will find one that is going to fit my norms. So I'm not at all convinced that this is going to be emancipating. I think it's just going to lead to more searching for the right guy. And the right guy will be the one who is earning more, has a better status and so on. And just to come back to, to uh, <laughs> Jackie's point, although you see from the slide that she presented that the uh, marrying up or partnering uh, up is going down, it does not mean that it has disappeared. Moreover, her slide is in a sense confusing because hypergamy refers to different things. So, so it can refer to status. The status can be occupational status, prestige. It can be wage, so just the money you earn, or it can be education. Now, I couldn't see from your slide whether we were talking about education there, but one of the interesting points is that obviously, at the moment at least, there is a relatively strong connections between, connection between these three types of status. So even if you would have a change on one of them, education, for instance, it does not necessarily mean that you would also have a change on the others. And there are, there are by the way, studies that indicate that. So, but still, <laughs> the point, if I take it, that Jackie is making is that uh, women are no longer marrying down, so they are marrying up, so they are now changing the norm. Uh, well, I would really doubt that. I think that they are indeed now more marrying down but not because they have a choice, but be exactly because they have no choice. There is no one there to marry neutral, so to speak. And so what do they do? They choose the next best option, which is marrying down. So it's not a voluntary change of choice, due to choice, but it's a reality to which women adapt. Can, can I maybe come in just to... Um, uh throw something else in and, and that is to, to what extent the assumptions that are being made on both sides um, are based on a presumption that women freeze eggs with the intention of using them. Um, Jackie showed some data and I think this is reflected probably in the clinical experience and we see it in a number of publications that the majority of women who freeze eggs actually conceive without using them. Um, do you think that that recognition changes the arguments in any way that it, it's, it's, it's simply a sort of a plan B rather than a plan A? I think it's just part of the uh, of what you do. You know, you plan for your future, don't you? You plan for retirement, you plan for career, you plan for education and so on. And you when you plan for those things, there's a whole array of things that you consider and you may have primary career, secondary career, or I'll do a bit of this and a bit of that, and I'll then pick and choose. So I think they're, they're using all the tools available to them to plan for their fertility. And, you know, it could be, you know, what we're talking, what we're seeing is, of course, when we first started, everybody was freezing their eggs at the point 35, 37, 39, 40. But now it's increasingly younger people who are using uh doing the planning right so that's the way i see it well honestly i think that and and i i agree on that point you there, are, there might be many possible reasons why women are deciding to freeze their eggs uh, obviously they they start according to me from the idea that they should have this in case they need it of course, when we, and there are a number of studies indicating that it's not because they froze their eggs that they're all of a sudden going to sit in the sofa waiting for the man to come along. No, they do a lot of different things very actively, trying to find a partner, trying to find another solution that does not utilize their eggs. So, but that does not mean that if the occasion arises that they would not use it. So I think from that point of view, it's more the insurance kind of idea. It is there. I can use it if I need to. And I think we should also be very careful by looking at the situation and the studies we have now, because as Jackie rightly remarks, the, the point is that we were at the very early start of this phenomenon. And it might very well be that in the future, we might see a different population coming up, not only younger, but I think that 
I had the I had the discussion with uh, uh, Nicole Noyes uh, a few months ago, and she was in making the point that in her setting, so this is New York, um, there were many more uh, women coming back for their eggs to go alone. So meaning as single mothers. Now beforehand, the first batch of women, so to speak, were clearly focused on the heterosexual setting and finding the partner. While in this case, it seems that they seem to be in a way um, relying or accepting the fact that that might not be the case. And that in that case, the second best option that we had initially is no longer the second best option, but in fact, also one of the options that might really be considered. Now, that would mean that if we go further along the line, that probably the utilization rate would be a lot higher in the future than what we see now. So, of course, it's exactly. quite difficult to predict that. But I, I, I think that what we have now are the, the, the initiators of the process. And it might, in 10 years time, be quite a considerably different setting. I don't really believe that it's going to lower the mean age. Uh, first of all, it costs a lot of money. And if you have still a lot of options open, why would you do it? But nevertheless, there might be other changes by people who have a slightly different perspective and are less relying on the heterosexual norm. Exactly. But that's the point. So that, you know, the behaviors uh, create new social groups, potentially the social group of people who had children with frozen eggs and they establish their own norms and their, their choices, these are their choices. The, you know, in a way, uh, positions are not uh, static, they're dynamic, right? So although you may say right now today, my, my preferred option is heterosexual, the fact that in three years you've now chosen single doesn't mean that that's a lesser import, uh, autonomous choice than the first one, right? You've, you've come to terms and you've come to a realization that that now is your choice. And Guido, you probably don't know about this, but the Gilbert principle always says that you pick a first thing, but if in two years I say to you, you can't, or in a week I say to you, you can't have your first choice, but you can have your second choice. The second choice will become the preferred choice. So it's kind of like a, a socio-psychological principle. So I think we all need to consider that uh, we're in a, as you say, in a changing environment now. And what, what's happening now is also predictive of the future and potentially future family formations and so on. So let's make egg freezing available. Uh, uh, can I ask, are we taking this based on a question from Cheryl Van der Poel? Um, uh, we're seeing more and more sort of lesbian couples coming through for treatment and, and, and women, um, perhaps um, uh, homosexual women thinking about preserving their fertility. Um, do you think the, the, the same arguments apply in that regard? Um, um, will, will the same drivers drive the reasons for um, social, the social reasons for freezing eggs in women who perhaps don't have long-term plans to be in a male or a heterosexual relationship? That's what uh, the title of my slide had, heteronormative, just yes. to make clear. I'm just translating that. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be a very small group. I mean, compared to, to, the, to the, the total population of women who are going to freeze their eggs, this one is going to be a small group. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. If, if you look, again, I'm relying to a large extent on all the studies that indicate that the reason is lack of a partner. So I'm coming back to that. So if that is the reason, then it's not up, as up to us to say, oh, but yeah, you know, it's going to change and very soon. It will not be the lack of a partner. At the moment, it's lack of a partner. So the question is, how do we handle that? And so then the, the question of should it be available? I've, I've answered that. I think it should be available, but it should not be reimbursed. And for that, I have a different reason. And that is that if this is indeed the case, that this is only true for highly educated women, then this is already a highly privileged group in society. It's not those you should support if you have to spend public money. Yeah, but you do already in IVF. 
Oh, I see. This is, uh, we knew this would happen, you know, arguments back and forth and more and more new ideas uh, will come in. The, the time is up, uh, uh, so we have to close uh, this. Uh, otherwise, most of the attendees will, will leave us anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, a complicated topic, a touchy topic, uh, a topic which will change over time, uh, perspectives uh, for sure. So this is not going to be the last discussion on this topic. Uh, but thank you so very much, uh, the two of you. A pleasure. Then Thanks very um, much. we have to try to finalize uh, this uh, third uh, joint uh, I3 RBMO uh, session. Uh, you've seen uh, uh, very vibrant, uh, uh, many different issues. This particular section focused on society implications of, of uh, uh, medical interventions in, in fertility arena is hot and uh, um, often debated. Uh, uh, so all in all, I think we can all look back at a very challenging uh, uh, 90 minutes. So just a few, a few comments uh, and a few remarks about RBMO. Uh, uh, I guess most of you are aware of uh, how the journal is uh, doing, uh, alive and kicking with an ever increasing group of people, both the editors and section editors, you've seen some of them at this webinar and at previous webinars. Uh, so we are very, very active. Uh, we, we, I think we, I can proudly say that, uh, that slowly impact factor is increasing. Not that it's the only parameter we consider relevant, uh, but still it's important. Uh, we see that that's one of the most important factors for authors to choose which journal they submit their papers. Uh, we focus heavily uh, in the last years on good uh, informative reviews. So if you have ideas or suggestions, please uh, uh, let me know. We started a new uh, uh, section, which, which I really uh, enjoy, and it's called Counter Current, uh, which we invite opposing uh, views. Uh, and we invite, uh, we have the editors together, we've jointly identified topics which we would consider relevant, identified authors, invited them. Uh, so you will see a whole series in the next like, six to 12 months uh, of uh, people that have views which oppose uh, uh, common uh, knowledge, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, I really look forward to this. Uh, and last uh, thing that I would like to mention is, as we see today at the at attendees, they really come from all over the world. Uh, and we also see that in the contributions published in RBMO, it is really a global journal from every country on this globe we see papers. Uh, so I think this is something really we can all be proud of. Uh, okay, before I give the floor to Nick uh, to do the final closure, I would like to uh, 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 acknowledge and, and tell you that we have a fourth and last uh, meeting planned webinar, RBMO Live. Uh, jointly with uh, I3, and this is going to be on Tuesday, November 7. And for this symposium, we have uh, uh, chosen to focus on andrology. And, and the male is an often uh, 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 neglected, uh, ignored uh, uh, area in fertility. Look at today's debates. Uh, I think it was all about women uh, and we should not be, you know, make fertility like a female issue uh, only uh, for sure. The only, I think the only thing we learned today about males is the lack of proper males eh, considered by, by women and that's why they freeze their oversights. Uh, so hopefully we can have some positive data about male involvement in fertility and reproduction in general. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as the chief editor of RBMO, I'm proud of where we are, and I need all your support to continue on our steps uh, forward. And now I give the floor to my co-chair, Nick, please. Thank you very much, Bart. And um, let me thank everyone for joining tonight and uh, all our speakers and participants. It's uh, terrific. Uh, thanks for all your work. For those, for those joining us, uh, it's very helpful for us to understand your views on it. So when, when you leave this uh, webinar this evening, the, a, a new browser will open on your screens with a very brief feedback uh, survey of four questions. And we appreciate if you would answer these because they can help us guide us for future RBMO 
and other um, IVF uh, journal you know, events. Um, so thanks to everyone. I'd also like to thank the team at I3 who've really been fantastic in supporting this event. Jacques Cohen, Peter Nagy, Giles Palmer, Thomas Elliott, and Marianne Sevete, uh, and, and indeed Shasta Sandrudin as well has been a, a great help. So um, the, let's talk about the next uh, general meeting, that the next IVF initiative session is coming up soon. It's the 20, on the 21st of uh, September at the same time, same place. Um, and this webinar will be uh, provided by Alpha, the International Forum for Sciences in uh, Reproductive uh, uh, Medicine. So do, uh, do join that meeting. I think it will be another very exciting one. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank you all again um, and all the speakers once again for their, for their preparation and participation and wish you a very good evening. Bye-bye.